I think what conservatives ought to focus on in terms of, of labor policy and economic policy more, more generally um, is restoring the ability of, of people to support families um, uh, with their with their work and and support them primarily with with a single income. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's so. Some of that has to do with directly with labor and employment policy. Obviously, a lot of it is is outside of that core space. Like this, uh, immigration policy plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. Trade policy mm -hmm. plays a huge role. Um, and in in particular, um, I think paying more attention to the ways in which low like lower skilled men um, are not well served by this uh, by this current economy and our our, our policy choices mm -hmm. uh, is something that conservatives need to pay more more a lot more attention to Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and this week it is just me again. Nick is off in Moscow, Idaho, getting in trouble with a bunch of extremely conservative but very libertarian uh, Christian podcasters out there. Uh, he's doing stuff uh, with New St. Andrews and uh, the Cross Politic guys and, and a couple other people out there. Uh, be sure to check out the episode he did with them. Uh, today, I had on a very dear friend, someone who's been, I think, a mentor and 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 really helped shepherd me into life in DC in a pretty big way. We had on Jonathan Berry, who's a partner with the Boyd and Gray and Associates Law Firm. Uh, Jonathan served as the assistant, acting assistant secretary uh, for regulatory policy at the Department of Labor uh, during the last two years of the Trump administration. And we had a conversation largely inspired by this here document. Um, I'm holding it up on the YouTube video. What it is, though, is the Department of Labor and Related Agencies chapter in Pillar One of the Heritage 2025 Presidential Transition Project Policy Book. Uh, and this is uh, looks like about 30 pages on a totally expansive imaginative agenda for the conservative movement and a allied president on labor policy. And there's conventional stuff that I'm sure you can imagine getting DEI out of labor policy, ending disparate impact, things like that. But there's also some very unconventional stuff. We talk about how we should ban bachelor degree requirements from the private sector. We talk about works councils that might make it easier for employees and companies to be able to negotiate with each other and negotiate with each other in a less adversarial manner we talk about the gig economy the issues with that the case for sabbatarian laws that make it harder for employers to maintain the same levels of commercial activity on the sabbath and we also do a little bit of a tour through Jonathan's previous uh, line of expertise before he became the labor guy, which was helping shepherd the majority of President Trump's uh, lower court and uh, lower court nominations when he was at the Department of Justice. Uh, Jonathan is one of the most brilliant people our movement has. Uh, he is exceptionally prolific. He has a whole army of children. Uh, and I'm just very, very glad that he's on our side and not the enemy side, because uh, whatever he does in his career, uh, it's going to be hugely impactful on the future of not only the conservative movement, but specifically uh, what uh, our little corner of it wants to do on a variety of issues. Uh, there was like 50 other things we wanted to talk about on this show other than some of those topics I laid out. We didn't get to it, uh, but we will have him back. I promise to talk about that and much more. To give his formal bio, Jonathan is a partner with the Boyd and Gray and Associates Law Firm. He's an experienced regulatory litigator, counselor, and federal executive. He leads BGNA's fuels regula regulation practice, representing coalitions and regulatory proceedings in litigation before the D.C. Circuit. Uh, before that, he was the head of the regulatory office at the U.S. Department of Labor, where he oversaw the development process of dozens of proposed and final rules. As the regulatory policy officer, he regularly represented the department to the executive office of the president and the office of management and budget. During Mr. Barry's tenure, the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs credited the Department of Labor with over $10 billion in deregulatory cost savings for the American public. He previously served in the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Policy, where he assisted with the confirmations of Associate Justice Neil Gorsuch and dozens of other federal judges, along with the development of the sessions and brand memos on the proper use of subregulatory guidance documents. He also served as the Chief Counsel to President-elect Trump transition, advising on 
ethics and legal policy. He was an OG guy. Um, before his executive branch service, Mr. Barry worked at the international law firms of Morgan Lewis and Bocius LLP and Jones Day, where he focused on regulatory and appellate litigation. He served on the teams that brought King versus Burwell, Affordable Care Act, challenged to the Supreme Court, defended Virginia Governor Robert McDonald against a corrupt prosecution that was ultimately vacated by the court, and protected the Bladensburg World War I Veterans Memorial in an establishment cause litigation case that led to a landmark victory in the court. He graduated with distinction in the major from Yale College, where he was a National Merit Scholar and served as Speaker of the Yale Political Union. He later graduated from the Columbia University School of Law, where he received an E.B. Converse Prize for Best Original Legal Writing, served as the executive editor of the Columbia Journal of Law and Social Problems, and won National Chapter of the Year from the Federalist Society. He previously served as a law clerk to Judge Jerry E. Smith of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and to Associate Justice Samuel A. Alito of the Supreme Court of the United States. I don't typically read out bios that are that long, but I think every single layer of that bio tells you a little bit about who Jonathan Barry is and why he is so incredibly valuable to our movement, uh, a real MVP. Um, if you have something useful that you want to talk to him about, let us know because he's always open to clever and interesting ideas. We'll go now to our conversation with Jonathan Barry. Jonathan, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Saurabh. We always like to hear how people got to the point where they are today, especially a lawyer that managed to make himself actually useful to the world around him. <laughs> Tell us, how, how does one actually manage to do that uh, and, and the path that got you here? Oh, my gosh. Um, so um, I've been involved in uh, conservative movement stuff um, really since I was a teenager. Um, I was, uh, you'll laugh, but I was a, it was a page at the 2000 Republican National Convention. Wow. Um, I, I saw um, Governor George W. Bush uh, give his acceptance speech. Uh, I think uh, The Rock spoke for some reason. Um, and uh, Hank Williams Jr. Uh, it came out and there was like usual kind of country music stars. Uh, it was a wild weekend. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, in starting in college, I got involved with a lot of conservative organizations. Um, and uh, I, a lot of, a lot of writing, um, a lot of campus conservative journalism, opinion journalism. Um, and that, um, that got me into um, more opinion advocacy work before uh, mm -hmm. before law school. And so then, that's why you're useful as a lawyer because you're completely unconfirmable in yeah. Article Three position, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so you uh, did you go to law school right away uh, after undergrad or no, mm -hmm. no. Um, I spent I spent three years at a political consulting firm doing essentially like free market opinion advocacy yeah. stuff. Um, uh, I could get my my op ed writing time down to about three hours. And mm -hmm. so now when I return to that, I'm embarrassed at how long it takes me to write to knock out <laughs> 700 words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you, you, you would you went to law school during, I would say, sort of the the early days of, of the apogee of sort of the the classic conservative legal movement and way mm -hmm. of doing things. Yes. Go to a fancy law school, potentially clerk a couple times, go to a big firm. Walk us through like what the the environment and sort of tenor and and theory of of that kind of person at that kind of time was like hmm. so i'd say with within the conservative bubble i was uh, very heavily involved in the federal society mm -hmm. chapter um at uh, at columbia for for law school um it was um hmm. uh there wasn't a tr like a tremendous amount of of internal friction friction there were I'd say running debates between um, the more libertarian folks and the more socially conservative folks. Uh, I was firmly in the latter camp. I also ran the pro-life group um, at the at the school, but um, everyone. It was. I think it was generally just a question of like what to emphasize, like how much programming were, programming were we going to have on economic liberty um, and how much um, uh, socially conservative stuff. Um, could we do? Um, maybe I th something that I, th I I think I've picked up is very different today. Uh, this is how um, we in our little conservative cadre related to the school as a whole is that uh, like we were tolerated. Like there there was not much. Um, I made sure like I I wanted to make sure that 
um, my my classmates in law school were getting exposed to thoughtful conservative perspectives they weren't likely to hear otherwise in their in, in their lives. So, for example, all three years of my time in law school, uh, our chapter hosted a debate on uh, on same sex marriage um, and whether to um, because this was pre Obergefell, mm-hmm. this was pre um, uh, Justice Kennedy on that. And all three of those were, I think it's fair to say, the most heavily attended event um, that our chapter would put on uh, in the year, and and like basically civil, uh, pe- you know, mostly peaceful, um, es- essentially. Um, and I mean, I can recall offhand maybe one or two snarky tone policing type comments or questions from the audience. But Was the juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, and it, it, you know, at, at the time I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you do after law school? So um, after law school, I had the privilege to uh, clerk the greatest appellate circuit in the country, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, for Judge Jerry Smith, who sits, keeps his chambers in Houston, um, uh, and that's a, the appellate court for Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Um, that was in uh, 2011 to 2012, uh, and then I went to. Uh, storied law firm Jones Day here in DC, uh, where I spent three years um, doing, I, I would say, mostly uh, mostly regulatory litigation, going going hammer and tongs after this or that um, part of the administrative state. Um, uh, uh, I, was the, I was the junior attorney on a team that took the second big challenge to Obamacare to the Supreme Court, a case called King versus Burwell. Um, and um, I uh, was on the defense team for Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell. Uh, like, boy, what might have happened uh, in an alternate <laughs> universe, right? Um, and um, and also on the team that defended the uh, Bladensburg World War I uh, war memorial um, uh, against an Establishment Clause challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, this I, I is was, that giant cross up in Maryland. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah, that's yeah. right. Only it's 40 feet in context, <laughs> it does not dominate the landscape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and, Didn't uh, mean to give you PTSD there. <laughs> yeah, um, no, no. It was a wonderful, wonderful case. And a- after I left the firm, uh, the Supreme Court um, ultimately vindicated what the American Legion had done in, mm-hmm. uh, in building that cross. So were you um, day one at the Trump administration, or how did you end up winding your way in? I, I was. I was actually, um, I guess in some sense, day minus 120. Mm-hmm. Um uh, after I um, uh, after I finished with Justice Alito, I spent. Um, so you did clerk for Justice. Yes, Alito that's well. right. Sorry, after after Jones Day, I spent a year with Justice Samuel Alito, uh, who was a living legend, and I'm just uh, I will always be, be blessed by that. Um, after that, um, uh, I went back to a, a different firm um, uh, briefly, but was also asked by Don McGann, who I knew um, from Jones Day a little bit. Um, if I would, uh, if I'd be interested in working on the transition team, this was um, this. W- I, I started in September of 2016. Um, not a lot of optimism at the time uh, that that transition team was going to have much to do after election day, mm-hmm. uh, and um, obviously very pleasantly surprised. Um, Where were you election night? Uh, I was in Trump Tower, okay, um, helping out with election day operations, and I remember. Uh, grabbing a friend at one point at like 11 p.m. after I think Pennsylvania had come in, just like shaking and saying, "We're winning, we're winning." Because um, um, I was, I yeah, I, w- I was very, I was very pleasantly surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so I, I helped out um, with developing some of the kind of uh, uh, pre-administration legal work, um, uh, and where I when I served as chief counsel on the transition. Uh, and then went into the Justice Department on day one, um, uh, sworn in on, uh, I think, within about 45 minutes um, after the, the president gave his inaugural address, um, uh, and primarily to help with judicial nominations, um, secondarily with regulatory policy. Mm-hmm. And there was an immediate big judicial nomination fight. That's right. That's right. So that the the by far the um the primary work um at first was uh helping Judge Gorsuch uh prepare for his confirmation mm-hmm. um and uh and making sure you know we had teams of people 
um, building up binders of, of of case law on different topics to help make sure. And this is the sort of the standard procedure you do for any SCOTUS nominee. Well, what is it that people don't understand about that process of of what a SCOTUS nomination is like on the back end? Oh my goodness. Um, so, you know, what I guess one thing to appreciate is. Uh, these look pretty tightly uh, controlled and framed. If you, you know you're, you're watching this through video clips or um, uh, uh, snippets, excerpts from the from the confirmation hearing or something like that. What people, one thing people don't see is just the is the amount of preparation that goes in both by the nominee, him or herself, because um, uh, it's just it's it's exhausting. You've got to basically trade off. Um, between um, meeting as many senators as possible um, uh, with um, digesting just reams and reams of material, making sure that your command of every possible area of law, like, and, and here it's going to be primarily constitutional law, but that everything that may potentially get asked about, you're, you're, you're fresh on, you're up to speed on. Mm -hmm. um, and none of this is fair but it is you know yeah. it's like it's like is it necessarily fair to make someone perform on camera in that way in a way that is not really analogous to anything they'll be doing in the job yeah, yeah. It, it, it you're right it's not um it's not all that it's not all that similar to mm -hmm. what uh, what someone actually does as mm -hmm. a <clears throat> as a sitting judge um but it does allow some some kind of testing of how this person this person's command of the subject matter mm -hmm. maybe get some kind of feel for reasoning ability mm -hmm. uh, on the fly but of course um the uh especially for the supreme court you know you've got political theater to the nth degree and you know i, I worked on gorsuch uh, confirmation which was comparatively tame. <laughs> <laughs> would you say it's more of a game of addition in terms of votes or a game of subtraction in terms of votes Ooh, um that's a good question i i would say probably subtraction um don't where, disqualify yourself yeah, at each I, stage. I, I, yeah I, I i tend to think so mm -hmm. um uh you have I, th this stuff just given how for, for better and for worse and I, I think there's some good things to say about this how how partisanly charged um uh, this process is um you can you can typically expect hope to have um the uh, the, the the president's party um, in the Senate, um, supporting the nominee, but then you've always got you've always got the senators on the margin um, who may either substantively disagree or are feeling some political pressure, and that can, that can go for go for Republicans, it can go for Democrats. Mm -hmm. What what part of the administration does one do this job from? Helping out with the nomination. So there's there are two offices um, that do the the bulk of the work. Um, one is the White House Counsel's Office. So that was that was Don McGahn at the beginning of the Trump administration. Uh, Don was was counsel to the president, uh, and then there is the where I was the Office of Legal Policy that sits within the Justice Department, mm -hmm. and so they tend to share uh, the labor. Um, uh, the counsel's Office tends to take um, the lead on setting up um, interviews, who it is that's going to get going to get considered, and they're of course closer to the president in advising on um, his final nomination decision. But OLP um, tends to do lots of the blocking and tackling in terms of um, not only assisting with judicial interviews, but once there's been a provisional selection made for a spot, doing lots of the background vetting. Mm -hmm. um, so I. Uh, I did several of those personally, and I I oversaw the assignments um, of uh, of a lot more of those mm -hmm. vets for lots of other judicial candidates. Um, uh, and then once someone's actually nominated, OLP also takes the lead on shepherding that person through the confirmation process. Although, mm -hmm. as needed, there's White House involvement too. Mm -hmm. How um how has this process changed in the last twenty years? You know, I, I imagine with the advent of like digital technology the sophistication of the process where people dig through every single thing that anyone's ever said um or even sniffed at has ramped up mm -hmm. um you know, it, it just seems like the, the, these these nomination hearings have gotten 
to be a much bigger deal than they used to be. And I'm not saying that in kind of the wispy, we wish it was apolitical. It's like, whatever, <laughs> it's the most important court in land. But but then I say yeah. that and Robert it's like, Bork has a few words right, about that. Well, well so, so that's but that's what I that's that's the thing, right? Is like the Bork the Bork hearing was was huge at the time. The Thomas hearing was huge uh-huh. at the time. So like, what's the trend line to pay attention to in this process? Yeah, I, I guess that the the trend line, as you alluded to, I think is just like increasingly microscopic scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you're right. A, a, at this point, um, I think your typical nominee needs to expect that. Basically, anything they've ever said or written um, is going to be um, is going to is going to come out, or they need to be they need to be ready for that. Um, and moreover, that it's going to be if it can be used against them, no matter how unfairly or uncharitably, um, like to, just ripped out of the context mm-hmm. um, when someone was originally speaking. Um, that's I think that's gotten a lot. A lot nastier, a lot edgier, um, and the you would know more about this than uh, than, than I would. But um, the desire to take increasingly like microscopic little um, media clips and just try to make those frame the global narrative as to what's going on. Um, that yeah, I think that that trend is only has only intensified. Although you know as. I mean, Justice Thomas described his his hearing as a high tech uh, lynching, essentially, <laughs> um, and um, so there was there was plenty of media circusry at the time too. Yeah, do you think that this process, that SCOTUS nomination, and even in general Article Three judgeship nominations, has become is affecting the sort of temperament and mindset of your typical young conservative lawyer in a positive or a negative way um i don't know how i hard to see how it's positive um i mean i I guess um i i I, I would agree i didn't want to ask a leading question though (laughs) why does this suck so much (laughs) yeah 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 um um, so i i guess the only the, the only positive that comes to mind is seeing how um seeing how a lot of good men and women have been treated um, in this process is is arguably it's it's clarifying. It could be radicalizing, um, and just knowing you're not going to be you're not going to be treated fairly um, no matter what. Um, uh, so um, I don't think that's I don't think that should be licensed to like um, to be to to behave badly or anything anything like that. But I, I think it may cause some people to be a little bit less worried about um, trimming their sails in hopes that the you know the the hand of God is going to descend on them at some point in their life and they get nominated to something fancy. Yeah. So you help out with the nomination of of Justice Gorsuch, and mm-hmm. then what's next? Um, so for for the balance of my time at OLP, I was I helped out with the uh, the nomination and confirmation process for a lot of lower court um, judges. I don't have a total count. Um, I want to say I touched, uh, given the, like how long this stuff takes, even though I left in April 2018, um, I, um, I I saw um, the process move for, I think I can say the majority of President Trump's judicial nominees, mm-hmm. um, given how front loaded a lot of it was. But we were, you know, we were very assiduous about populating, especially the circuit courts, mm-hmm. um, with um, uh, uh, with 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 good judges. Mm-hmm. If you had to pick favorites, who would they be? <laughs> if They're you can't, <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's a lot of there 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 are a lot of folks who are really really thoughtful. Um, uh, some folks, some folks who come to mind, um, uh, who've worked, I've become a fan of, it would include like, um, uh, judge Andy Oldham, for mm-hmm. example, who keeps his chambers in Austin, Texas on the, on the fifth circuit, uh, is one, um, another would be judge Steve Menashe on the second circuit. Patriot. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and, um, yeah, I think those are, those are, those are two, yeah. two examples of really, really thoughtful folks. Yeah. Well, those are also on my list of favorites. So good. <laughs> you passed the test. All right. <laughs> and then you 
leave in 2018 well uh -huh. what why did you and uh and where'd you go next so i had i I had a long dormant um, interest in the labor and employment space. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think honestly, some of this goes back to my uh, uh, to my father. Um, my, my father is also an attorney. His father was also an attorney, mm -hmm. um, and my my dad in particular um, uh, did a lot of employer defense work in mm -hmm. Los Angeles, where I grew up. California legislature is always doing something pretty aggressive, and gave. Like all, there's always a new reason to sue employers. Yeah. Um, and so that was a, a, a good swath of my dad's practice. Mm -hmm. And that was really formative for me in terms of thinking about what, what lawyers are, what they do. And I, th I think that's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, um, I had an opportunity uh, to go serve as um, the head of uh, policy and rulemaking at the US Department of Labor. I was appointed by Secretary Alex Acosta um, and um, served in that role for I think two years even so mm -hmm. for uh, for the mostly the balance of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Walk me through what the opportunities for a conservative administration with the Department of Labor are. Mm. You know, an imaginative, aggressive, active presidency. W what's the macro framing? that one should have for, for labor? Yeah, um, uh, this is a big question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm glad you asked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so let me, let, me, let me first, I wanna frame it um, in, a, in a bigger picture mm -hmm. uh, first. Um, the simple or more straightforward piece is, relates to political reality, uh, which is that the, um, I think as we all appreciate by now, um, the Republican and Democratic partisan coalitions have shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a lot of, uh, if historically or at least recently, uh, the Republican Party was um, sort of middle class voters and upper middle class voters. Um, I, I think quite a lot of those upper middle class voters have been peeled off by the Democrats. Um, I think a lot of it relates to their affinity with the overlapping professional managerial class. Mm -hmm. I think the Democrats are more comfortable in that space. Um, but at the same time, um, Republicans have picked up um, a tremendous amount, like tens of millions of working class mm -hmm. voters. Um, so that's that's the like the background political reality. The I think the 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 where this starts to shade into policy implications is that I think Republicans need to be better about addressing the concerns of Americans as workers. Um, uh, and and not only in the the limited sense of like Americans as ownerships or people looking to maximize um, opportunity, though I think ownership is great, opportunity is great, but um, the, the maximal distorted perspective on this being like every American is business owner, which yeah. which, which honestly seemed like the central driving force behind the imagination of a lot of conservative economic policy prior to this era. Yeah, I, I think I think there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to I, I think it's important to emphasize that um, we have to have we have to have a big tent. We've got to have um, as broad a coalition as is feasible. Um, uh, and uh, business owners, especially small business owners, um, I, I think continue to play a huge role um, in an effective Republican slash conservative coalition. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, especially today, especially how the coalition has evolved, um, that most of the people who are being that conservatives need to speak to um, uh, when they're talking about economic policy, they are their workers and they're typically to be specific, wage earning employees. They like they work for someone else. They draw a paycheck. Uh, the income comes in on a W two. Mm -hmm. All that nerdy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and speaking to them as workers um, is is just is just mission critical. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I believe. I think I think Republicans have been better about speaking to sort of ordinary Americans, whatever that means, as as believers as members of families mm -hmm. um as um as like american citizens still need some improvements on that and 
Um, but uh, this is kind of this this is new. You know, maybe it's maybe it's old. Like Henry Olson has laid out how um, Reagan did a lot of working class oriented messaging mm -hmm. um, in 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 his campaigns, for example. And I think we do need to recover um, some of that. And and I think I think likely do more. The GOP has always been relatively flexible on messaging. What's often harder to get them to budge on is policy. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. with the political gloss taken care of, and I think we've made a lot of progress on that yes. as a movement in the last couple of years. What is the substantive policy shifts that need to happen that a president could enact through the Department of Labor that would put our money where our mouth is mm -hmm. on being mm -hmm. a working class movement? Yeah. Um, so it's let me okay. Let me let me suggest an organizing policy theme um, here, which is um, which is agency, um, and which I would define as participating in like setting the direction of one's life. Mm -hmm. um, this has this has importance in all kinds of contexts, um, you know, beyond the workplace. But I do think it matters in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then last, as a as a technical note, um, uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about here covers all of the federal labor and employment agencies. So there's, in addition to how they chop up jurisdictions is kind of goofy and historically contingent and all that. Um, but DOL, um, for sure, but also Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, mm -hmm. National Labor Relations Board, um, and, uh, and and I could, there's there's others, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. enough. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Um, the, the the first example that I would point to in that regard is would jurisdictionally fall under the NLRB, um, which is promoting what are called works councils. Um, this is a uh, this is an opportunity for um, a, a, a works council is a is a voluntary organization, um, typically select whose leadership is is elected by workers by by employees at a workplace. Um, to um, uh, speak with management about um, uh, core terms and conditions of employment, mm -hmm. um, and and like it it allows um, it gets away from um, the the sort of the asymmetry that can happen where like if an individual employee has a concern like uh, that can be unnerving um, to to bring up directly to management. There's some there's some collective emphasis behind that, but it's also it's not adversarial um, as you do have in the context of a labor union when a workplace is unionized. Mm -hmm. we, we'll, we can talk more about unions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's um, uh, I think at, at larger employers a a works council is a a serious way by which Im, like employees can have voice um, in how um, in how a, a company actually runs and there's. There's a lot of research. Our friends at American Compass have done some great polling on this, um, indicating that there's a lot of interest from both employees and business management um, in having um, these improved channels. Um, uh, part of the problem is that realistically, a lot of these works councils are not going to happen without financial or other support from the employer. Um, uh, like to basically provide the infrastructure for the like the, the, that infrastructure has got to come from somewhere, um, and the current sort of the standing interpretation of National Labor Relations Act. I'm sorry, this is getting wonky. Um, this is a wonky uh, like, podcast. <laughs> it's the um, wonkiest of podcasts. All right. Um, uh, uh, the current interpretation of the NLRA um, uh, arguably forecloses. Um, that kind of employer support, and the, for an understandable reason, which is you don't want company unions, you don't want a, a labor union that's basically like an employer sock puppet mm -hmm. um, that um, uh, uh, that's that's not looking out for for workers. Mm -hmm. This is not this is not a labor union, mm -hmm. um, and so you could have, for example, the NLRB uh, do a rulemaking to make it clear that this is copacetic. This mm -hmm. is this is okay. Are there countries that have both works councils and unions um and if not then w what is the kind of comparative analysis one can do on on the nature of the relationship between labor and and capital in countries with works councils versus countries with unions so there um there are 
um, countries. And I think a lot of these days, I, I think it's still accurate to say that um, I'm not enough of an expert in this space. Uh, that a lot of Western European countries have have both of these existing mm -hmm. simultaneously. Mm -hmm. It is also one non comparator is that um, a, a lot of those countries have sectoral bargaining, for example, um, and that's a we don't have that. We don't have anything like that. Um, What's and, sectoral bargaining? So sectoral bargaining means that a I mean at least one way to to describe it is. Um, uh, unions and like a collective, a collaborative of unions and of management representing all or mostly all the businesses in a particular industry, they get together and they set a terms and at least the like the baseline terms and conditions of mm -hmm. employment for the entire industry. And the idea behind this being to take take the competition on like labor policy between companies off the table. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, I, I think that's that's probably the strongest selling point. I'm not um I have I have previously endorsed and I, I still endorse like um conservatives thinking and talking about like this among a spectrum of ideas. I think there are um I think there are there are very serious agency issues with labor unions mm -hmm. uh, in the United States today. Um, and I would, I think those have to be addressed mm -hmm. before anything more radical could even be considered. I'm not, I'm not sure even after that, that something like that is appropriate, but um, it's just, it, it, so it makes the like straight up apples to apples comparison with what we have in the United States is a little bit tough mm -hmm. as a result. So these works councils, mm -hmm. uh, it would mostly take an NLRB rulemaking that would clarify that you can definitely do this mm -hmm. and then what would you expect a cambrian explosion of, of these things popping up all over the country is it is it as simple as way, well, waving trial magic bites wand? and yeah. uh, and, yeah. and and bonus trial yeah. bites and yeah. jawless fishes yeah. um uh all of that um i i don't um i think it will probably be more more gradual than that um uh but i do think it's it's one of it's one of several Items. I, I something else that is is a little bit within um, the labor agency's direct ambit, but I think to really go big on this would require more work from Congress. Mm. Is to allow for is to move towards more of a tier of separate tiers of regulation for large and for small businesses. Um, this is like this could be true across like the regulatory landscape, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, I think that oftentimes big businesses do use the regulatory state as a way to cut down on competition from smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. In the DOL context, we saw exactly this dynamic happen with the OSHA vaccine mandate, mm -hmm. um, where um, the um, the uh, you saw this interesting spe spectacle of some large businesses egging on the Biden administration to put this mandate out there, um, in part so that they would not have to compete in the labor market with smaller businesses who didn't want to subject mm -hmm. uh, people to the jab. Um, yeah. Like you could have easily seen, had that not been the case, a major movement to mom and pop employers from laborers across the country. And it seems like one of the biggest bottlenecks in the economy over the last few years has been the ability to have workers. And so if there was this oh, massive yeah. competitive edge given to- Especially blue collar workers yeah. who are highly resistant in, yeah. in, in huge numbers um, to, uh, to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that I keep on ranting about until people listen um, is that- Or until you stop talking. Right. <laughs> is, is, is that technology has- been more responsible for a lot of the changes in American society than conservatives like to give it credit for. And yes. one of the things that it enabled was a giant uptick in gig work since mm -hmm. the late 20, uh, 2000s. What does the gig economy factor into all of this or how does it? And, and how should we be thinking about the posture that conservatives should have towards the balance between gig work and more traditional 
W-2 employment as as would have been recognizable to, you know, someone who was thinking through these same issues in any of the Bush administrations or the Reagan administration. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, so this is a huge topic, mm-hmm. um, as you know. Um, and um, I, I would... I would say I would say a couple of things. Um, uh, the um, the flexibility that goes along with gig work um, is is both a blessing and a curse. Um, uh, I, for the I think there is a there's a very sizable portion of the workforce that um, uh, that either prefers or needs something with a lot of with a lot of flexibility mm-hmm. to it. Um, and so gig work does um, uh, uh, does aid with making that kind of thing available. Um, on the other hand, um, if like if you've got on the spectrum between there's like flexibility on one end and stability uh, on the other hand, uh, for people who are the the primary economic support uh, for their families, um, I think that um, uh, I think that's a lot harder uh, for gig work to be um, to be adequate for that, and I I don't um, I don't know enough to um, to to really opine. So I want to s- stress this is this is speculative, but I would be curious to understand more of the economic research on how has um, uh, has the like the extent to which the, the growth in gig work has eroded um stable work mm. in for for those people who need it and and like honestly between the two um the i i strongly suspect that this like stable work is is more important uh, mm-hmm. than than flexible work like mm-hmm. some people need this some people need that as between the two um i think we probably have to give priority to the more stable stuff mm-hmm. there's also a separate issue which is that um uh what we put under the the umbrella of gig work um, can include what I might call more traditional independent contracting, um, mm-hmm. and like being a um, uh, being a handyman, um, being um, just a self employed professional. That's um, there's like a level of kind of human capital that someone possesses that doesn't necessarily go along with. Um, being a ride-sharing driver or something mm-hmm. like that, and it's it's important not to uh, not to not to confuse the two. In the big public policy pushes around gig work, which mostly have come from the left, do, do those groups of people in their policy proposals get sort of condensed into one class? I, I so I think this happens on I, I think this happens on both sides. Mm-hmm. I think. Um, uh, well, the re- the reason I I find that interesting is. You know, going sector by sector, the places where where gig work is most visible, and I won't say this is the places where gig work exists the most because I'm I'm smart enough to know that I'm st- too stupid to know exactly where all the gig work is. Um, you know, you take something like Uber. Mm-hmm. So Uber and Lyft, you know, heavily disrupt the taxi cab industry. Yes, but also create a novel form of transportation in most of the cities that they came like Indianapolis yes, yes. did not have a thriving taxi cab market right, you know right, before right. and so okay uh you know that creates that that might be additive and and th- there is a cut on a lot of the gig economy uh which you know is fun which is it's essentially a tax on the PMC lifestyle mm-hmm. like you know <laughs> which like that's that's fun too it's uh-huh. like you know it's like okay yeah fine you want you want to drive around in your ubers and get your doordash and stuff like mm-hmm. we're going to peel $1000 out of your annual <laughs> uh, out of your monthly budget because you you you're too lazy to do your own work and have a car like fine mm-hmm. so, but you know w- w- what are the sectors where there was more stable employment available um that has been most disrupted by the gig economy Ooh. would you say that's a that's a good question, and I, I I'm not I'm not sure I can I can put my finger on a good one, mm. um, right off the top of my head. Um, uh, like I don't think there are. This is going to sound like a cop out, but I don't I don't think there are easy answers here. Um, I think conservatives need to be need to be cognizant of the trade offs and neither like recognize that. Um, yeah, there's you've got these poles of flexibility and stability. For example, mm-hmm. um, 
is 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 one aspect. I think another aspect is recognizing that th- I think there is something um, sort of AI type dispatching or or um, uh, interactions where you've just you've got all your human interactions are super heavily mediated by um, by some sort of technological interface. Um, I do think that's a real. I think it's a real. That's a real challenge. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I think it's. I think that is a real impediment to a more more human face to face interaction, which we just we don't get enough of um, in our society today. Not even not even close. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that that you and I have always been interested in is is how can social conservatives take a bigger role in making public policy not just on their you know little ghetto of like abortion religious liberty and, mm-hmm. and small issues but but in every domain one of the most interesting i, I wouldn't call those small issues but i would call uh, them discrete mm. <laughs> yes i i agree uh, <laughs> but there is a phenomenon in dc that you know th- th- there are all sorts of people that would love for nothing more than for all social conservatives to have to say on public policy to be on those issues yes for sure um but there, there are implications for social conservative values across many issues. Uh, one of the interesting proposals um, that that you've laid out in in Project Twenty Twenty Five Handbook from Heritage is uh, stuff around the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. What, what what are some of the ideas that you have there? Yes. Um, so uh, this is it sounds it sounds controversial. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in many respects, it is a it is a return to something that basically always everyone ever had mm-hmm. um uh and it, it's specifically the idea of um encouraging sabbath rest um through discouraging commerce mm-hmm. um on on the sabbath um the 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 proposal that's in our book mm-hmm. is uh, amending the the basic federal overtime law fair labor standards mm-hmm. act to require that overtime be paid uh for all work uh, done on the Sabbath. Um, oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't think um, uh, I, I don't think I don't think Congress has um, the authority to mandate uh, like a national closing uh, mm-hmm. on on the Sabbath. This was that was always a a state decision mm-hmm. um, to do that. But I, let me add, it was always a state decision mm-hmm. to, to do that. They did um, it, <laughs> and, and yeah, I'm not you know I'm not saying this practice was. Uniform, homogenous, uh, whatever, but um, very, very widely spread, and only, only recently, in the last um, few decades, um, have uh, have most states moved moved away from this. Um, so this is, um, I think, this is about as far as the federal government could could properly go mm-hmm. in this space. Um, but it would be an encouragement and inducement um, uh, to um, to to rest, but really to kind of coordinate commercial activity for the other six days mm-hmm. uh, of of the week, which mm-hmm. is as for as uh, as long as we've had mm-hmm. Sabbatarian uh, civilization, mm-hmm. you know, beginning like beginning in Israel and continuing into Christendom. Mm-hmm. Um, this is something that's been increasingly a part of the rhythm of civic life. Mm-hmm. Uh, most importantly, for people to have space to worship and honor God um, and and secondly, to have times of communal rest uh, with their families and with their communities. Do you think in a in an America where family formation has plummeted, the commercialization of every part of life is 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 continuing and abundant, um, and religious observance is is down? Yes. Do you think this would just result in like people getting paid more on Sunday, and but the, but it would look all the same? I, I so I think I think there would be some of that. Like I, I don't think this is a I don't think this is a panacea. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's but the law like the law is a real teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this would I think it would prompt as as all laws do um, meaningful repl- reflection by by serious numbers of people about um, the importance of rest and what what rest is for uh, and and separate and apart from. Uh, its hortatory function, um, it's it it changes economic incentives, mm-hmm. and so I I do think you would have a lot of employers who would be shifting work. Now, a lot of a lot of employers do a fair amount of this already because mm-hmm. a lot of people naturally disfavor um, Sabbath work. 
mm-hmm. for whatever for whatever reason, and often command some kind of premium mm-hmm. um, to uh, to work on that. Temperature check in the twenty thirties. The median household in America will be a one income household, a two income household, or some one and a quarter, one and a half, or one and three quarters oh, style income household. <laughs> if you had to, from that, from those five options. Well, that's, that's a lot of options. Um, probably, probably something like um, a one and three quarter, like maybe one and a half um, mm-hmm. income income household. Um, I think that a lot of people are. It remains the, it remains the case, and I um, that um, most most people um, want a a household setup where you've got one primary earner and one secondary earner who typically is um, earning a substantial amount of money, but it's it's less and it's more in a, in a more flexible. There's your flexibility mm-hmm. point setup. Mm-hmm. Um, than maybe what the main earner is is doing. Do you think that a major goal of conservative policy around labor and in economic policy more broadly should be to bring that number further down? Hmm. Um. Honestly, um. So let me let me let me say this. I think our over the course of the 20th century and continuing, um, there has been a there's been a real devaluation of uh, of real, what I would call the domestic economy. Mm-hmm. People more profound than I have have called the same thing, um, and like all all the ways in which to the extent where. The term domestic economy even exists because that's what economy means. <laughs> yeah, right, right. This is, this is, this is like oikonomia. Um, um, uh, that's which that, means uh, that means. Uh, uh, hang on, I can do this. Sort of like rule of the household, yeah. right? Um, uh, so the domestic, domestic. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, and and there's a like there is like there's a lot here. Um, someone I would direct folks to is. Forgive me, I'm going to mangle her name. Erica Bakioki uh, has has written very thoughtfully and interesting, interestingly on this um, that uh, points out unt- really until industrialization, um, you had the cottage industry, so to speak, was the the primary way by which families supported themselves, and you had you typically had in complementary ways husbands and wives working together in mm-hmm. ways that were uh, seriously economically productive. Mm-hmm. Um, what what to do today is 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 honestly kind of is thorny, complicated. Mm-hmm. I don't have I don't have a clean answer. Um, what I would I, I think what conservatives ought to focus on in terms of of labor policy and economic policy more more generally um, is restoring the ability of of people to support families. Um, uh, with their with their work and and support them primarily with with a single income. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's so some of that has to do with directly with labor and employment policy. Obviously, a lot of it is is outside of that core space. Like this, uh, immigration policy plays a huge role. Mm-hmm. Trade policy mm-hmm. plays a huge role. Um, and in in particular, um, I think paying more attention to the ways in which. Low, like lower skilled men, um, are not well served by this uh, by this current economy, and our 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 policy choices mm-hmm. uh, is something that conservatives need to pay more more a lot more attention to. Yeah. Um. One of the things that's very very novel. Um. So I'll, I'll forgive you if you don't have fully formed thoughts on is what's about to happen with AI. Mm, um, yes, I think your profession, the legal profession, is probably going to be affected more about this, uh, more of, uh, affected more by this than, than most. Um, I, I sort of yes. again find myself grinning because I think it might be a kind of white collar Armageddon, and like it, <laughs> might, it, might, it might actually rebalance like a combination of the end of of ZERP and zero interest rates and um, the the advent of AI might actually break the back of the college industrial complex Mm -hmm. uh, what my friend michael gibson calls the paper belt Mm -hmm. more than any policy decision uh we could make but but what are some of the 
early thoughts you have on what's going on with AI. Oh, goodness. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think as there is a, um, for better and for worse, there is a, there's a, historically, there's been a pretty tremendous demand for kind of middling legal writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think AI is going to bite into that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, hope to avoid that, but- mm -hmm. uh, 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 you're, you're pretty elite with what you do. <laughs> check back, check back in a couple of years. Uh, we'll 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 see. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, this is I I, I kind of want to put this in the same um, realm that Oren uh, puts it. Uh, Oren Cass puts it in his book that uh, by and large, um, increased automation has has transformed jobs, but mm -hmm. is not. Um, uh, uh, like eliminated the ability of people to um, to do meaningful work. Mm -hmm. Far from it. We're not going to be in a like Kurt Vonnegut had this book. It was a Player Piano. Mm -hmm. um, that's about uh, essentially about automation, just making it such that no one had anything to do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. That that's my like initial reaction. Is that what you'll see is a lot more. Um, and there's there's glimmers of this already, even in the in the legal industry specifically of um, the the attorney or like some of the legal professional who works to um, sort of curate and supervise um, the fruits of some um, computer process. So this this happens a lot in what's like e discovery, electronic discovery of documents, mm -hmm. where you and I are in a lawsuit. Um, uh, heaven help us both, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, I would lose. Yeah, yeah we'll see. <laughs> um, I'm not that kind of lawyer. Um, uh, and um, you know, you might you're, if you're a if if you are a company, uh, you might turn over 10 million emails in response to a discovery request. Right now, um, it's it's pretty standard to use a lot of machine learning stuff that I don't personally know a ton about um, to like uh, be able to more intelligently pick through that stuff, and that that is like man working with automation mm -hmm. um, already. You see the same thing with AI outside of this space. You look at some of these like AI generated um, images or videos or stuff like that. And, like some of that stuff is super unsettling, but mm -hmm. um, a, a more neutral way of talking about that is I think a lot of um, AI curator roles will exist, but you know, these, these thoughts are worth what you paid for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Tying into white collar Armageddon, uh, the uh, veblen good of of the professional managerial class is their college degree, mm -hmm. and yes. one of the more radical proposals that you guys have in this uh, presidential transition project uh, report is the idea that the federal government should ban the requirement of bachelor's degrees yes. for jobs uh, in the private sector. How dare you? <laughs> How could you? How dare you? How dare my you? My Hayek reader is crying in my pocket. What's going on here? Well, <laughs> how could you impose such a such a dark imposition on the private sector? Explain yourself. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, so uh, this like Greta Thunberg going. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, um, so this um, this comes out of a recognition that, um, or at least my 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 personal view. I don't want to speak for everyone else. Um, is that the the current shape of the labor market where you have m hundreds of thousands, if not millions of employers who use a simple BA requirement as a screening mechanism mm. is itself the fruit of pretty serious prior state intervention um, in the labor market. So on the one hand, um, this comes, th there's been massive subsidization uh, of people pursuing higher education, whether mm -hmm. it's actually like a good match for their skills and talents and interests or not. Um, the, the number I, I keep hearing is in this country, we spend $150 in subsidy for every one on higher education for every one we spend on vocational education. Wow. That's this is the uh, and, and really all for the benefit of the the best off economically minority, the kind mm -hmm. of the top 20% of the economy, which is uh, regressive, like whoa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that uh, that's that's a huge distortion that this is this is aimed to try to correct. The other distortion um, comes out through, um, and I'm not I'm not going to go into too many boring details, but um, 
the the way that Title VII, uh, the big federal um, employment discrimination law, has been interpreted, um, it's very difficult and be very costly for employers to use some kind of aptitude test as a screening mechanism for employment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, usually over current concerns about uh, about disparate impact, mm -hmm. you're going to see sort of racial disparities or whatever emerge mm -hmm. um, through the taking of that that test. The problem is in the absence. So that that's a screening mechanism that is uh, that's comparatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It's inexpensive for the employer per person, mm -hmm. and it is it's also inexpensive for the applicant. You know, you you sit down, you take a 45 minute multiple choice test or whatever, and you're done. Um, uh, since that's been that's been seriously disfavored under Title VII, um, and just like when you push, it's like it's like a you know a water balloon or water bed. You kind of push down here, it's going to pop up over here. Um, it's created a, a lot of employer demand for BA requirements mm -hmm. as a screening mechanism, yeah. which and, is kind of like an aptitude test, except is subject to all sorts of distortion and a hundred fifty thousand dollar paycheck. Yeah, and and like a four year or whatever, or in many cases six year yeah. opportunity cost of your life. Yeah. Extending adolescence, pro prolonging family formation, destroying people's ability to own a home, typically like all bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just and like just the, the the collateral social consequences there have been have been enormous. So 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 you're pretty clear that like in order for the banning of a of a BA box, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, you you would need to to allow those aptitude tests back into the labor market. I think that would so they they are allowed. Um, there's just a uh, call it like a heavy compliance tax mm -hmm. um, that you've got to pay if you want to yeah. if you want to do it. I think yeah, yeah. like all the big con like uh, management consulting firms, like they have a very like rigorous set of aptitude tests and everything. But they are also the biggest management consulting firms. Right, in the world. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, that's that that's right. Um, and a lot of uh, tech companies sometimes do this, uh, do specialized aptitude tests yeah. instead of yeah, instead like a of coding interview or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that's right. So I, I think it would uh, for this to I think for this to have its fully full effect, you would need to reduce pressure on um, aptitude tests, and that that fits in with an an, an upstream part of this um, a, a transition book. Where we've proposed abolishing disparate impact um, yeah. as just a whole theory of liability. Yeah, and that's that's another one of those things that that I've been obsessed with for years. I, I remember very early in my time in politics, um, my least favorite Obama appointee was Tom Perez mm. because he, I think, accelerated dramatically disparate impact theory, especially as it's as it's applied to to the workforce and and to american companies mm -hmm. is that accurate was he particular in his in his i have to think so i uh, i i don't want to i don't want to dump on your, yeah. your, your your bad attitude yeah. which i respect yeah. um uh but i i do think i uh, my my impression is that um as labor secretary he did advocate for that i know that in the the kind of the funny corner of anti-employment discrimination that DOL deals with mm -hmm. uh, for federal contractors, which is about a quarter mm -hmm. of the economy. Um, uh, my, my recollection is that he was he was pretty aggressive about pushing mm -hmm. some like really aggressive theories, like where you like even comparatively modest disparities mm -hmm. um, were like, okay, that's that's discrimination. Like mm -hmm. that's that's no good. Yeah. Uh, Tying in some some of your your different areas of expertise, does a does a Supreme Court decision on affirmative action make any of this easier or harder? Um, what, what what's what's the lay of the land likely to look like in three or four years? Um, sans the implementation of, of policies on disparate impact, and then if, if you were able to do it, what 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 are the possibilities? Um, well, if we don't get what we propose, it'll be a wasteland. Um, <laughs> and if we do, it'll be paradise. That's on right. Earth. That's um, right. <laughs> very straightforward. Um, so, um, yeah, if the court, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, you know, we, we, we filed a brief supporting the challenges to affirmative action uh, at the at the court right now. Uh, if the court um, pulls the bandaid off and says that. Um, uh, diversity is not a permissible rationale for mm -hmm. for discrimination on the basis of race. Um, I think that's going to have a lot of ripple effects mm -hmm. in um, all of the other sort of realms where where DEI has really got its hold. Um, mm -hmm. I think most profoundly is going to be in the workplace, mm -hmm. um, where um, e even though ironically the like the case law doesn't actually 
support this, you have a lot of employers doing affirmative action or other race-based preferences um, on a pure diversity rationale. Um, and so I think this is going to, I think it'll send a shockwave and I think they should expect um, to see real challenges to those programs mm -hmm. following on the heels of, of, uh, of a hypothetically aggressive SCOTUS decision. Mm -hmm. Tying together some of the different ideas we've talked about here, what should the goal be for the next conservative president in how the American economy and labor market looks different at the end of a successful four or eight years? I think the goal needs to be, um, uh, as to return with the theme I hit earlier, um, greater greater agency for workers. Mm -hmm. um, like more people, uh, I don't know exactly how you want to quantify this, but ten ideally tens of millions more people. I think this this is at least an eight year project, but mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 feeling and actually having the ability to meaningfully participate in setting the direction of uh, of their lives, meaningfully influencing, having voice into um, kind of how um, how how the businesses they work at carry out uh, their work. Um, I don't think this has to be done in in an adversarial uh, fashion. I think if we I think if we promote, I think some of it does come down to promoting ownership. Like mm -hmm. uh, a wonky thing that's in here is promoting employee stock ownership programs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, uh, ESOPs or plans, excuse me. Um, uh, but having um, more more human scale institutions, frankly, more small more small businesses, where I think it's easier for a worker to be an employee to be meaningfully involved um, in in how things go, and then also on uh, on works councils, which I think are um, a a very good approach for uh, for larger businesses, where you can have a form of collective representation that gives that gives voice in. I would add to that um, uh, reforms to um, how labor unions are structured uh, in the in the United States to reduce um, how adversarial uh, they are um, and to reduce how political they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think understandably a lot of conservatives, and I, I, I tend to agree with this, are hesitant about doing anything that may increase labor union power because labor union power in this country right now is generally speaking directed at sort of woke progressive ends. You've got the you know, AFL CIO or SCIU spouting off about abortion or praising um, job squeezing environmental mandates. Um, uh, and that's like, that's a real mismatch. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think um, conservatives interested in labor policy need to recognize how, how just how screwed up that that system yeah. is before don't, don't be too cute by half on like being like and the workers of the world will unite and they'll be a conservative revolution yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's like there is like th there is something there's something serious worth digging into there um but in the short term without um without serious reforms to make labor union leaders more accountable to their members more responsive to more reflective mm -hmm. um all you're going to see is uh, like union empowerment ends up just kind of siphoning off that sort of healthy worker energy mm -hmm. and dues money and political organizing uh, in favor of the same kind of failed consensus. Yeah. Jonathan, where can people keep up with everything that you're up to? Oh my goodness. Um, you don't uh, post. You're not a Twitter person, I, unfortunately. I'm not. I'm I think not. it'd be great if you were. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, they can, they can uh, check out my firm at uh, boydengray.com, B-O-Y-D-E-N-G-R-A-Y.com, yeah. uh, or also at boydengrayassociates.com, same law firm, yeah. um, uh, and 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 keep up with uh, keep up with the work that we're doing. We are we've recently stepped up our involvement on the Twitter, so you know, watch out. <laughs> Yeah, you have some Zoomer working there that's running that for you guys. Um, <laughs> no comment. Makes you think. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for coming on the podcast. I highly encourage people to check out uh, the chapter you wrote for, for Heritage. And thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for having me, man. This was great. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that conversation. It's one that definitely needs to continue. And I think it will have 
Jonathan back sooner rather than later to talk more about some of these fun issues. As always, be sure to check out everything else we have cooking at AmericanMoment.org. There you can find the backlog of this podcast, as well as news items, Amcanon, other events that we're doing, and more. Be sure to rate and review this podcast, five stars. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, and be sure to tune in next week for yet another episode of Moment of Truth. Thank you guys, as always, for listening. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Thank you.